Welcome to the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, featuring stellar conversations with emerging and established Wickedly Smart Women. Thanks for joining us today as we celebrate women who are committed, care deeply, and have the courage to take action and create conscious change all around the world. Now here's your Wickedly Smart host, Angel B. Hartwell. Welcome to another episode of the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, where we celebrate wickedly smart women and provide our listeners with a wealth of wisdom, along with immediately actionable steps to be smarter, spunkier, and more successful in their impact and their leadership. This is your host, Angel B. Hartwell, and today we welcome our exceptional special guest, Frances Jones. Francis is a CEO, two-time best-selling author, public speaker, advocate, and certified coach. She is a highly sought-after keynote speaker for various women empowerment summits and was televised live on Fox Souls, the Tammy Mack Late Show, to talk about Black infertility. She has been featured on countless media publications such as NBC, CBS, Fox Affiliates, radio and podcast shows, including ours today, and has spoken on virtual stages with Les Brown, Dr. Cheryl Wood, Lisa Bevere, Gary Chapman, Dr. George Fraser, and Cora Jakes Coleman. She is the TV show host on the Inspire Together show powered by the Women Win Network. And I had the distinct pleasure of meeting Francis at the National Publicity Summit in late 2001. And as soon as I heard her pitch, I knew that I needed to bring this angel onto the show to help any of our listeners around the world who may be struggling with infertility. Welcome to the show, Francis. Thank you so much, Angel. I'm so excited and so grateful to be here. Oh, my God. You know, in the green room, before we got started, we were setting intentions for our time together today. And as soon as we started to to go into that space, I could feel how powerful and how potent you and your work are. And I just want to begin our time together by saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, for taking something incredibly painful that you've experienced and turning it into treasure that can help others. So I'd love to have you give us just a little bit of your backstory. Okay. Thank you. First, I want to say you are most welcome. It's such an honor and a privilege and a blessing for me to be here to share from my heart, from my experiences. So I came from a very fertile family of women. My mom, she had 10 children. She had a sister that had 10 children. Another sister had seven children. All of my sisters are able to have children. Most of my nieces that are of age have children, but I was never able to. And because of my being the oddball out, you know, that hurt a lot because Mm. I thought If nothing else I would be able to do, coming from a fertile family, I would be able to have children. But that never happened for me. I had a stepdaughter that I became a full-time instant mom when I married my husband. At the time, she was a four and a half year old. We got married, full-time mom. On my very first Mother's Day, not long after I got married, at church, excited about Mother's Day. We're going to celebrate afterwards. I sang in the choir. And church is over. And one of the ladies in the choir walked up to me with her arms spread open wide to give me this big hug because other women have been saying, you know, congratulations, happy Mother's Day. But this particular woman came to me and she said, happy Mother's Day, even though you're not a real mother. Now, I was not expecting that to happen. I wasn't expecting. I wasn't prepared for that statement. And so I looked at her with bewilderment, thinking, why would you say that to me? But What her reasons were, in my opinion, because I wasn't the biological mother, that made me not a real mother. And a few months after that, I found out that I was having fertility challenges. My husband and I, we wanted to start a family immediately. Our daughter was a single child. She wanted to have siblings. I wanted to be able to provide. I came from a big family. I'm ready. Nothing happened. And I told my husband, I think there's something wrong. I want to go and get checked out. Long story short. 
I was diagnosed down the road with stage four endometriosis, low egg reserve, and low egg count. Long story short, it wrapped up. I couldn't have children and I hurt for years and no one knew it but me. Wow. Okay. So I want to be really tender in our time together because, you know, this is an incredibly tender subject. Mm -hmm. And what that woman said to you was unfair. And, you know, it's beautiful that you were able to, you know, understand it wasn't about you. It was about her. So I want to ask you, what was the emotional toll on you as you made this discovery and began grappling with knowing that you were never going to be a biological mom? Well, it... The thing about it, it didn't make sense to me. You know, it's like, wait a minute, all of my female relatives are having children. What's wrong with me? Have I done something to cause this? Did I do this? Am I responsible? And stepping back a little bit, when I was age 19, I was having a conversation with an acquaintance and she came from a big family as well. And she asked me, do you want children? I'm like, yes, I want children. Well, how many children do you want? And I told her, oh, I want five. I had it all set out. And I had a, in, in high school, I had this memory book and I was writing the names of what my children would be. And so when she asked me that and I responded, she said, you want five children? Oh, you're a real woman. So now here I am at the stage where I'm not able to have any kids. And now I'm wondering, am I a real woman? Mm-hmm. My emotions were all over the place. There were times when I wanted a child so badly that I thought I was having pregnancy symptoms. And so I'm all on the internet searching and searching and trying to find out, yes, yes, this must be it. When it was really in my mind, there were no symptoms because there was no pregnancy. And every time that my husband and I went through fertility treatment and after that particular cycle, I had to go to the doctor to get an ultrasound, get a pregnancy test. And they're looking at my womb and I'm looking on the screen and the womb is empty. Once again, I felt unworthy. I felt like damaged goods. My my self-esteem plummeted Mm -hmm. because I'm watching everybody, neighbors, co-workers, friends, family, bring forth the one thing that I could not. And it hurt And I didn't know how to get out. And I couldn't tell anybody because I didn't think they would understand. My sisters have children. Sure, they were, they would empath, they would sympathize with me, Mm. but they really wouldn't understand. This is something that a person really don't know how it feels unless they actually go through it. Mm -hmm. Like and so nobody in my family had gone through it. Now I did have one sister that had two miscarriages, but she was able to bring forth a child on the third try. Mm. But me. Not one time was I able to conceive. So my emotions were everywhere. And I I heard it and just everything that was going on, even the fact that I would begin to have conflicts with my my stepdaughter, who we never used to worry step in the house. I was just mom. And she called me mom and I never asked her to. This is what she wanted to do. She felt comfortable doing that. But then when I started having problems with her, because she wanted to go and live with her biological mother. She lived with her dad and I, we had full custody. And now she's blaming me for her and her dad and her birth mom not being together. Oh, that was a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Well, Francis, what I'd like to do now is ask you what you were able to finally do for yourself that allowed you to start to turn this trauma into treasure that you can now offer to other people? Like what would be, what do you recall was like the first thing that had to happen to get you on a path to healing? Well, one of the most important things is that when I was going through all of that trauma, all of that hurt, I lost myself. I didn't know who I was anymore. I was too busy trying to be a real woman, so to speak, to be a real mom, to bring forth life. And that I I lost me. I I lost myself. I was so consumed 
I let infertility control me. It took my joy. I state emphatically that infertility is like a thief in the night. And if you let it, it will rob you of your joy. It will rob you of your life. And I let it hold me at gunpoint and rob me. And so what I had to do, what Francis had to do, Francis had to go back and learn Francis all over again. I had to go back and do a self-discovery journey. I had to find out the things that brought me joy. Because remember, I lost it. Mm. I had to go back and find the things that brought me happiness, like butterflies. I love butterflies. When I see them, it brought happiness to me. But Mm. I had forgotten about that. Mm. I had forgotten about the thing that made me special. I love to laugh and make other people laugh. But I lost the ability to laugh because, and, and I'm not saying that I was depressed and I never laughed. But what I was saying that is that I lost the real me. Mm. And I had to go back and find the real me. And when I went back and started notating the things that made Francis French, the things that made Francis special, I began to peel those layers of hurt off. And when I really realized that what was really wrong was just a part of my body wasn't operating as it should. And just like a person who has high blood pressure, there's a defect there, but Mm. they don't call themselves unworthy because there's a defect in their body. But I call myself worthy because there was a defect in my reproductive system. It did not signify who I was. Mm. It just said my body wasn't working like it should. Mm. And when I began to rationalize in my mind and knew that it wasn't Frances doing something wrong, it was just a defect in her body that caused it not to operate as it should have. I began to break free. It really wasn't me. Mm, beautiful. It was just something wrong in my body. Mm, beautiful. Well, so Francis, there's such a metaphor here for anyone who's listening, because I know that we have wickedly smart women all over the world who are tuning in, some of whom may be actually struggling with the same struggle of infertility. But as you were talking about how it consumed you and stole your joy. I want our listeners to really hear deeply that if there has been anything in your life, whether it's a business or an attachment to having to have a certain number in your bank account or an attachment to having to have a certain person be your husband or having to have a certain job or whatever that is that has taken and stolen from you, Hmm. that there is magic here in what Francis is talking about. There is true and deep magic in acknowledging first, like the first thing is acknowledge, right? That the joy has been stolen. And then the second thing is to see where that attachment has literally sucked you dry. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing I heard was the steps that you took were really a reclamation of understanding who you were and what actually would allow you to become more, you know, back on track with your own happiness, your own joy, and your own capacity to thrive. So we are going to take a short break, but after we get back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit about your book and about where people can find you. But right now, Wickedly Smart Women, we could use your help. If you're enjoying this show and want us to stay on the air, please consider making a donation at www.wickedlysmartwomen.com. We'd also like to ask you to share with your lovely lady friends, especially those who may be challenged with infertility. Share with anyone that you think might benefit from our content. And if it's about this particular topic, share gently and kindly. (laughs) Don't come in with a poker like that woman in the church. (laughs) Poking another person is actually not in service because what you poke will come back to you sooner or later, and it will be a lot more difficult for you to navigate than you can imagine. You know, what we put out comes back to us 10,000 fold. So be mindful what you poke. All right. I do want to say a big thank you to all of our listeners who are downloading, rating, and reviewing. We are welcoming thousands of downloads from all over the world. We're going to shout out this week to our listeners in Tennessee, which is where. Francis lives. And we're also going to shout out to our listeners in Turkey and Thailand since we're doing teas. 
All right, we will be right back with Francis Jones. The Wickedly Smart Women podcast is brought to you by the Wealthy Life Mentor. Women, are you on the edge knowing that life is calling you to make a change? Are you ready to be part of the evolution of what it means to be a wickedly smart woman creating your wealthy life by design? A life that is an extraordinary work of art. Angel B. Hartwell, the Wealthy Life Mentor, is hired by women in transition. Women just like you who want to break through to their brilliance, become clear on the value of their wisdom, and embody a beauty-filled, balanced life of shameless self-expression. Discover your Wealthy Life readiness by taking the quiz at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And we are back with Frances Jones. Before we went to the break, we were talking about her own path to self-healing. And what has happened is she has not only done a lot of her own self-healing, but now she actually helps people through her Heart Desires Coaching business at heartdesirescoaching.com. We will have the link for that directly in the show notes. And she's written a book overcoming the emotional stigmas of infertility, barren, but not ashamed. So I'd love to have you talk, Francis, about what inspired you to become a coach and what inspired you to write this book. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. So yes, right before the break, I talked about going on a self-discovery journey, finding Francis. Well, that was a part of my life prior to infertility that I I began to feel a void. I didn't feel satisfied in the career that I was in. And I wanted to, to touch lives in a very personal way, but I didn't know how or what I was supposed to do. So as part of my self-discovery journey, I came across life coaching and it intrigued me. I didn't know a whole lot about it, but something felt right about it. And I started investigating it. And I came across this particular school and I talked with the individuals there and it made sense. And so despite me giving up potential great salary as an IT professional, I told my husband, I want to go in life coaching. And so I decided to do that. And when I was in school getting my accredited certification, one of the things that the trainers told us is that think about the problem that gave you the biggest grief, the biggest heartache, and that's what you should focus. And so I thought about it and I meditated and the thing that came above all other problems that I had was the heartache that I dealt with related to infertility, related to not being able to have children. And I knew that was the the area I was supposed to focus on. And so when I began to to start focusing on infertility coaching, the connections began to come. Now, what made me write the book? Mm. Well, when I got to the point where I became free from those negative emotions, when I found Francis again, I knew that I wasn't the only one that was dealing with this. There's no way in the world Francis is the only one. And so because I was able to find purpose in my pain, I was able to find peace with infertility, peace with not being able to help children. I wanted to help other people to do the same. Because like I said, it's a thief. It Mm -hmm. robs you. And so if there was anything that I could do, even if I only helped one person, I was willing to share my story transparently. Now, keep in mind, I kept everything hidden. Mm -hmm. So that was not easy for me to do, to open up and share my life like that. But I put my own personal, you know, pride, so to speak, Mm -hmm. aside. And I thought of the greater purpose. There are too many people out there that my life could help, that my story could help. And so I decided to use my life my own personal experiences to help somebody else across the bridge. Mm, Beautiful. I love it. Thank you. So, and again, this is metaphorical because there may be people who are listening who don't have the infertility problem, but they may have some other massive pain that they have transformed and 
you know, Francis is a living model of what I like to call an empowered messenger and an empowered Mm -hmm. messenger has been able to transcend beyond the fear of exposing themselves and transcend beyond the fear of potentially being persecuted, prosecuted, or even executed for expressing themselves. And sometimes that persecution, prosecution, and execution comes from right inside of ourselves. So Francis, it's such a blessing that you have been willing to not only help others, but also to help others in such a global way. The book, I'm sure, is going to be a massive bestseller if it isn't already. <laughs> Thank so, you. And, and I would like to add something, if that's OK. Yeah, please. Um, so you've said it twice and, and, and you've hit the nail on the head. See, I don't want people to think that my book is just about infertility. Mm-mm. And I share this frequently. My book does three things. Number one, For those who are yet stuck in dealing with those negative emotions is to help them to get past the feelings of unworthiness and to stop letting infertility control your life. That's number one. The second thing, it reverts back to the individual that told me I wasn't a mother. So there are so many people who approach us who are dealing with infertility with questions and comments and things that they really shouldn't say. I don't think they mean harm, but they're not aware of what they're really saying and how it affects us. Like, why don't you have children? Don't you want children? Oh, there's a lot of kids out there. Why don't you just go and adopt? Not realizing that that can be very offensive to someone who is going through and hurting. And we're sticking ourselves with injections and all these different things to try to have children. So I want those who have never have been impacted by infertility personally to become aware of what we deal with so they can be more sensitive, compassionate, and understanding when they're having conversations with us. And that third thing is where you brought it in twice, is that infertility was the evil villain in my story. But hurt is hurt. Pain is pain. And so it's not about the character, so to speak. It's about the experience. Anyone who's hurting can benefit from my book. Anyone who's dealing with negative emotions, no matter what it's from, it could be from a marriage, it could be from a job, a heartache, a loss of loved one. The tips in that book can help individuals move past those negative emotions. My evil villain was infertility. Your evil villain could be something else. But still, the end result is that we want to be free and we want to find happiness and peace again. And that's what my book helps us to do. Well, and we want to be healed from the hurt. Exactly. Yes. Francis, you are such an angel on the planet. Mm, Thank you. All right. We got a few minutes left. So I'd love to have you, if you wouldn't mind, just talk a little bit. If there's a particular client that you've helped that you want to just spotlight, you know, your own story is incredibly powerful. Let me be clear. But I always love it if there's a client story that feels really powerful that you'd like to share just to double down on how much power we're putting out today to help people. Yes. Yes. I would love to. So maybe a couple of years ago, I had this client reach out to me and she basically, she was so caught up in pain related to not being able to have a child, not being able to conceive. And so she had convinced herself that she couldn't have children. And one of the first questions that I asked her is, have you ever been diagnosed with infertility? And she told me no. And so she had convinced herself. So I I sat with her and I coached her and and I mentored and encouraged her. And we got to a point where she was able to break that barrier. She removed the thought of, I can't have children. There's something wrong with me out of the way. And because I was able to transform her thinking, transfer the way she viewed herself in her life, she was able to bring forth a beautiful son. But she had a block. She thought that she couldn't have children. And because we were able to move those hurdles out of the way, she was able to conceive. And I was so excited for her. And every time I see her pictures, I always shout out and say, yes, yes, I knew it would happen for you. I spoke life into her and she began to believe and receive it and things changed for her. I want everyone to hear that. I spoke life into her and she began to believe and receive it Mm -hmm. and everything changed. Yes. How powerful is that? 
I mean, if if you guys aren't crying, I am crying over here. OK, you guys aren't crying. It's you know, it would it would be very surprising to me. Francis, your presence and your your kindness and your gentleness and your compassion is palpable. And I just want to bless you and your business and all of the people that you are speaking life into in all the ways that you are speaking life into those people. And I want our listeners to also hear, did you hear what Francis said? How interesting that it was a thought form, an emotional bind in her client that was actually preventing the new life from coming in. So, Francis, in the last minute or so, if there's one more thing that you would like to deliver into this space, I'd love to hear it. Yes. So I I want everyone who's listening right now to really, truly understand something. Your thoughts will be created and materialized. So be cautious on what you're thinking. See, I thought that I was damaged goods. See, it's a possibility that my thoughts could have caused the infertility, the endometriosis to begin to build in there. Perhaps because I thought that I was damaged goods, that perhaps my body replicated what I was thinking. So step one, if you do nothing else, if you get nothing else from what I'm saying, make sure that you're careful about what you think because your thoughts will become life. As a man thinketh, so is he. As a woman thinketh, so is she. And since we are wickedly smart women, we want to make sure we think wickedly smart so we can really receive the things that we want in life. It's us. We are the creators of our own life. We're the author of our own story. We're that character. We're the main character in our own book, in our own story. So make sure your character has a happy ending. Francis. I love you so much. I want to I want to actually bring you to my house and hug you and just spend time in your presence. You're so amazing. You're an extraordinary wickedly smart woman. We I mean we have a lot of extraordinary guests but, but I'm getting the tingles all over and I hope our listeners are as well. Listeners, we do love feedback. Please let us know what you thought of today's episode by calling in to our listener line. We'll have that number for you in the show notes or you can send in questions or guest suggestions to listeners at wickedlysmartwomen.com. We might even give you a shout out on the show. Thanks for tuning in. Keep your ears open and remember you are a wonderful woman. Thanks for tuning in, downloading and listening. Be sure to rate and review Wickedly Smart Women on Apple Podcasts and share with other women who can benefit from today's episode. Wickedly Smart Women is the premier podcast series for informing, activating, and inspiring the leader who carries profound wisdom and knows that now is the time to welcome wealth. We welcome your feedback and guest suggestions and invite you to subscribe to our mailing list to be notified of each new episode at wickedlysmartwomen.com.